we're going to kind of get into the weeds of what, uh, of what we're here to talk about. And, and no one better to lead us into this than Jane Stout. She's the Vice President for Biodiversity and Climate Action here at Trinity College. Um, Jane is a Professor of Ecology in the School of Natural Sciences uh, and an internationally renowned expert on pollinator and pollination ecology, prominent voice for biodiversity and its value in what I think has been one of the bigger years uh, for at least a biodiversity conversation than we've had in a long time. Jane co-founded the successful conservation initiative, All Islands Pollinator Plan, and the not-for-profit company, Natural Capital Island. Jane, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so. I titled my talk here, Tackling the Nature Crisis. And I suppose we, we start off with um, saying something really obvious, is that there's no doubt that nature is in crisis. Um, we know that we are likely to exceed the 1.5 degree global temperature increase that was the aim of the Paris Agreement in the coming decade. And if we don't drastically reduce emissions, we could see a three to four degree temperature rise by the end of the, this, this century. So to put this into perspective, the last time the planet was this hot was three million years ago. That's before humans ever evolved. We are not adapted for these temperatures. Our children will experience temperatures that no humans have ever lived through before. But the climate crisis isn't the only crisis in nature that we're experiencing. Three quarters of the land surface of Earth is highly modified by human activity for farming, for water extraction, mining, industrialization, urbanization, road building, dams. And with all of this human modification comes the destruction of natural habitats, habitats that have evolved over millions of years, many more millions of years than humanity has been around. And the intricate webs of interactions between the inhabitants of these places. And when we see this loss of uh, habitat, we see a loss of species and we see a simplification of nature. And the situation that we're in is that of the estimated 8 million species on Earth, I'm furiously clicking this, hoping that at some point the slides will switch, um, 1 million of those species are thought to be at risk of extinction. So 1 in 8 species at risk of being wiped out by humanity's activities uh, on this planet. Now, evolutionary biologists will tell us that species are always going extinct. We know that. That's a natural part of evolution. It's true. It's why we don't have dinosaurs roaming around uh, on Earth anymore. But the rate of extinction at the moment is up to 10,000 times higher than in the fossil record. So it's on a par with the mass extinction events that have punctuated Earth's history five times uh, in the history of life on Earth. And the last mass extinction was the one that saw the end of the dinosaurs. But it's not just about extinction of species, it's about the loss of populations, it's about the decimation of nature. So we're seeing population sizes of wild animals plummet. Um, and in my own lifetime, the average percent change in population size of vertebrate animals, so animals with a backbone, has seen a 69% decrease, and that's just vertebrates. These are animals that we do know quite a lot about. For most creatures on Earth, we just don't simply know enough about them to know what kind of state they're in. So for example, the insects, the group of uh, organisms that I work on, the, mice, the most diverse group of animals on the planet comprising 75% of all animal species. Insects, uh, many species of insect have been decimated by loss of places to live, loss of things to feed on, and toxic chemicals, pesticides, that we have designed specifically to kill them. And most insects, most species of insect, are not pests. Now, not every species is in decline. Um, those that can thrive in human adapted habitats or those that are useful to humans are increasing. And currently on Earth today, 70% of all the birds that are alive are farmed poultry. And 60% of all the mammals are livestock. And most of the rest of the mammals alive on Earth today are us. Only 4% of mammals alive on Earth today are wild uh, animals. 
So what we've done as, as, a, as a race, as, a, as a, a human species, is we have totally shifted the balance of the natural world, physically, chemically, and biologically. And we continue to extract resources from the natural world more quickly than they can regenerate. Fossil fuels, subsoil minerals, precious metals. If we think about all of us sitting here today, we all have a smartphone in our pockets. Um, the smartphone needs, oh, I had a picture, but it's not coming. The smartphone needs copper for wiring. Oh, there it is. It needs copper for wiring. It needs lithium for batteries. It needs cobalt to, cobalt to coat wires in, to make the microchips uh, work um, better. It needs gold and silver for, for circuit boards. And it needs aluminium, which makes up most of the outside casing. So your smartphone, that technology that's in your pocket, comes from natural materials from this earth. The clothes that we are wearing, um, cotton, uh, leather, comes from uh, plants and animals. Or our clothes come from synthetic fibers that are made from crude oil. All of these come from natural resources. And even the produ production of natural materials uh, like cotton, which is the most important non-food crop in the world, the production of cotton requires a huge amount of water, of agrochemicals, pesticides, and fertilizer in order to produce. And as our population, the human population grows, our demands uh, for resources from nature also grow. So nature underpins our food, fiber, timber production systems, organisms that keep the soil healthy and functioning for crops, animals that transfer pollen between plants for the production of fruit and seeds, these are our, our pollinators, animals that prey on other animals that would otherwise become pests, habitats like peatlands that act as giant sponges regulating water flows. So nature really underpins everything that we do. And understanding how we depend on nature and the complexities of nature and how we can maintain and restore ecological functioning is absolutely essential to humanity. Um, but as it was said earlier, it's very complex. We don't always know exactly which animals are the most important for pollinating different plant species in different places at different times. We don't know how populations of predators will respond to changes in prey populations, perhaps caused by changing climate. We know virtually nothing about soil ecosystems, about the bacteria, the fungi that ensure essential nutrients are, are recycled. And we don't know how these systems are affected by pollution. So predicting the risks and impacts of loss of species, um, how their interactions will respond to the warmer world that we find ourselves in, and what feedback loops there are and when they will be triggered, all of these things are extremely difficult. We're often asked as, as ecological scientists where the limits of the systems are. How far can we push them? And the answer is that we really actually don't know. There may be tipping points, these uh, critical thresholds, which when crossed will have severe, potentially catastrophic and irreversible impacts. But we don't necessarily know where those tipping points are or when they'll be crossed or how rapidly the impacts will be felt or how they vary from place to place. Uh, so, for example, the tundra, the frozen habitats in, in northern Canada, Greenland, and Russia, when the tundra melts um, as temperatures increase, it releases methane, a potent greenhouse gas. Um, and the higher temperatures uh, drive the growth of plants, of shrubby plants. These change the soil temperature, they prevent the snow from reflecting heat away, and they create these feedbacks which make the whole atmosphere warmer. In the news this week, we've seen um, stories about the West Antarctic ice sheets. And this is terrifying. They are, right, they are melting more rapidly than ever expected, even under a 1.5 degree increase scenario. The floating ice <coughs> will melt, and the glacial ice on the land will slide into the oceans, the knock-on being this rapid sea level rise. And this is thought to um, affect a third of the world's human population that lives uh, within kilometers of the coast. And also there are potentially far-reaching tectonic impacts as well. And as the climate changes and as we continue to destroy habitats, regional ecosystems are at risk of collapse with further feedbacks. So the Amazon rainforest, for example, is on the brink of collapse as an ecosystem. And that's due to both climate change and deforestation combined with things like rev, uh, river pollution. So this could lead to the change 
of, for the Amazon from being the world's largest rainforest to being a dry, degraded savanna within our lifetimes. So this isn't happening uh, next century. This is happening in the coming decades. Um, and what happens is when trees are felled in the east uh, of the Amazon or they, dry from, uh, they die from drought because of more frequent El Nino oscillations, which are a result of climate change, this means that there's less evapotranspiration, so recycling of water from trees, which means there's less rain regionally, which means more trees die of drought, which means less carbon storage, less carbon sequestration, more carbon to the atmosphere, increasing temperatures, and these knock-ons that happen at a much larger scale. And there are other impacts as well. So as there's more carbon in the uh, atmosphere, uh, it's absorbed into the oceans, and this increases the acidity of the water. This can reduce the growth of animals that make their shells out of calcium carbonate. Um, this doesn't just impact us in terms of you know, fewer shellfish to eat, the mollusks, the crustaceans that, we, uh, that form human food, but a whole range of marine organisms from the microscopic to the corals could be affected. And this has potentially catastrophic impacts on marine ecosystems, on marine animals that consume these organisms, on fisheries, on coastal ecosystems that are currently protected by reefs. So all of that to say that climate change and biodiversity loss have huge implications for us, for our societies, for our economies, for our ability to grow and harvest food, for timber, for fibers and other materials, also has impacts on our ability to cope with the impacts of more frequent extreme weather events, on our health and our well-being, and on how we interact with each other. Lack of natural resources or lack of access to natural resources is one of the key drivers of political instability and conflict. So this isn't just a crisis of, for nature, it's a crisis for humanity, for, for everybody, from the small farmers in Mozambique, the fishing communities in Indonesia, to the dairy farmers in County Cork, to us, the consumers who need to buy food and clothes for, for protection, who want to buy luxuries, uh, the tech companies who are keeping us uh, all uh, connected, the investors who don't want to lose money, the politicians who want to be elected uh, next time around. So what can we do? Um, we all know that we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We know that carbon capture technologies are not yet developed on the scale that is required. We need to reduce emissions to try and keep as close to this 1.5 degrees as possible. As I say, we are, we are on a trajectory to 1.5 degrees. What we don't want to be is on a trajectory to 3 degrees. So we do need mitigation, but we also need adaptation. We need to restore natural systems. Um, Protecting habitats like the Amazon, like the coral reefs, but also closer to home, Irish peatlands, can have regional scale benefits for tackling climate change, for ensuring economic activities like farming, like fishing and tourism can continue, and for supporting communities and societies. Global finance and trade is at risk, not just from primary industries. Uh, crises in nature will affect everyone in every industry. Some can adapt, but some are going to need to radically change. And we need to be pre prepared for this. We need to make sure that we can adapt, that we don't reach tipping points that are catastrophic. So here we are today uh, in Trinity College. Um, and my role in Trinity as Vice President for Biodiversity and Climate Action is to oversee uh, what we do in response to this crisis. Um, the biggest impact that we can have as a university is, is not in replacing our boilers or changing the windows of our beautiful heritage buildings. It's in educating the next generation of leaders who will make changes across all businesses, who will tell the stories, who will invent the technology, who will measure the impacts. So we need to give our students the skills and the competencies to deal with the crises in nature, which are crises for humanity, regardless of which degree program they are studying and regardless of which profession they enter upon graduating. So to that end, we've embarked on a program of work to embed education for sustainable development in Trinity's curriculum. These are our, our fellows for, for education and sustainable development. Uh, and we want to do that both within a disciplinary program, so whether that's music or hi art history or economics, science, dentistry or business, and to educate students also in an interdisciplinary context. We need to be able to speak to each other um, across disciplines. We need to be able to speak each other's languages. We need to get out of these disciplinary silos that can contribute to the tunnel vision. We need our students to think holistically, 
We need them to behave responsibly, to communicate effectively, and to continually develop so that every graduate is equipped to tackle these crises when they leave Trinity, both in their careers and in their personal lives. But we also need to do more than that. Uh, as an institution, we need to make sure that the knowledge that's generated through our research is co-created, again, across disciplines, that it's engaged, that we're working with external partners, and that our findings do have impacts on policy and practice. So Trinity can be a connecting hub for the brightest and the best young minds in our, in our students and our graduates with policymakers, with businesses, with social innovators and entrepreneurs. And this connectivity and creativity is needed for the transformational changes that are required across society and enterprise. Um, and we, as an institution, Trinity, we also need to practice what we preach. You heard from, from the Dean of the Business School this morning about this building with its state-of-the-art sustainability features. But if you look around the campus, 60% of our buildings are more than 100 years old. They're part of our national heritage. Uh, they pro they're protected for their cultural value. And this presents us with a massive challenge in terms of retrofitting to reduce our scope one and scope two emissions. And of course, that retrofitting also requires capital goods that contribute to our scope three emissions. Even if we could afford to do this, which as a public body that's deeply underfunded, we can't, um, we have had, uh, we can make other progress. We have uh, done a deep retrofitting project. So the uh, building here, the red brick building, the rubrics is the oldest building on the campus. Um, this has been uh, deep retrofitted to, to, to the highest um, uh, levels that we could do. Um, we can also do other things. We can reduce mowing. We can install wildlife ponds, plant trees that contribute to a network of green spaces across the city. Uh, these are important because they contribute to, to urban wildlife and provide, importantly, mental and physical health benefits to staff, students and visitors to the university. But we also need to work together, work with partners to connect these green spaces, to make sure that our staff and students can travel safely between places. We need to promote walking, walking cycling, and, and public transport. We can reduce our waste. We can increase plant-based menus in our catering outlets. We can generate our own energy with solar panels. There's an awful lot we can do and an awful lot we need to do because time is running out. And as institutions, we all need to operate in a climate smart and a nature positive way, and we need to prioritize human health and well being and make explicit that link between the two, between the planetary health and the human health. And as a nation, we need to invest in nature, it's our natural capital. But it's very hard. It's, there are no silver bullets. There are no easy wins. There are difficult decisions to make. There are trade-offs. There are new ways of thinking and working that are required. But I believe we have no choice. Uh, we all have to be in this together, and we all need to work together to tackle this crisis. So thank you. Ready?